Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Simone Farazin, and together with my partner, Andrea Trimarchi, we are the founders of a design office called Forma Fantasma, but also the curators of this edition of Prada Frames. We have been practicing in the field of design since 2009, and we have always been interested in the ethical implication that the act of design entails. And it is in this slide that we put together this uh, symposium, and in constant collaboration and conversation with the Prada team, with whom we share an interest in the dissemination of knowledge. And in this respect, I would like to thank a person who helped us in this process, supported and trusted us, and that person is Mrs. Prada. Prada Frames is a symposium that investigates the complex relationship between the environment and design outcomes. Under shared ecological lens and with a transdisciplinary approach, the symposium brings together designers, architects, curators, scientists, anthropologists, producers, activists, legal and economic experts. Considering the fact that Prada Frames is running in parallel to the Furniture Fair, we thought it was pertinent for this edition to focus on the ecosystem of the forest and the governance of the timber industry, but to extend beyond that and consider also the fact that the forest is a place also inhabited by a multiplicity of species, of course human and more than humans. We're extremely happy to be here in this location because it is obviously perfect for several reasons. The first one is that we are surrounded by a forest in itself. Um, bookshelves made of walnut trees, books made of uh, paper pulp, and of course the furniture you're sitting on. But also because this is a place of knowledge dissemination, obviously linked then to the content of the symposium. And with the curators of the Bradense Library, we select a series of books the most probably you've spotted in the vitrines at the entrance. They're wonderful publications. If you haven't had a chance to look at them, I invite you to do so on your way out. But also I would like to thank the Biblioteca Universitaria di Pavia for allowing us to film the beautiful Dendrografia in Suberica, which is an exceptional archive of all the types of wood in the region of Lombardy, where we are now, done in 1793 by Carlos Tomaschi. And you spotted the film most probably in the screen while you were coming in the room. In the morning session, we look at the works of architects, curators, and design students with an expansive understanding of the design discipline. In this session, we are about to understand how to sense the forest through smell and sound. We are also going to talk about the anatomy of wood as a source of knowledge and designing with and for more than human species. With no further delay, I would like to start the session and welcome on stage Beatrice Leanza, who will moderate the session. Thank you. Grazie Simone, thank you. Welcome everyone. So I'm Beatrice Leanza, I'm a design critic and curator. I'll be the moderator of this conversation with, da uh, with David Monacchi and Sissi Tolas that I'm inviting already on stage. So. <laughs> so we have decided with, with David and Sissi, we have decided to help you all uh, for the first two or three minutes to open up to different bandwidths of communication. So you have all received a card when entering here. Um, and so that, together with what we are gonna listen shortly, are excerpts of what Cecil and David do with their work and in their life. So uh, sharpen your ears, your noses, and listen to what we have to discuss in a little bit. Close your eyes. Close your eyes if you want. We can play the sound.
Okay, you can open your eyes or not. You can keep it closed. Because this is all not about seeing, but sensing differently. So uh, just to help us contextualize a bit what you know, David and Cicel are going to share with us today, uh, I think this space is perfect. This is a wonderful celebration of human intelligence, you know, is a temple of knowledge, uh, where the stories and artifacts that preserve human language you know, are, are, are concerned. Um, and, and in that sense, you know, they embody a very specific way in which we humans communicate with each other, but also of the world that surrounds us. And, um, and in this sense, also practices of cataloging or archiving, right, um, uh, of, of uh, collecting, um, they also speak of the way we come about, you know, conjuring the myriad fragments that, you know, uh, compose reality and the way we make sense of it. So, and, but yeah, so as one of our speakers likes to say, in the beginning was not the word, but the smell. Uh, as chemical molecules, actually, were the first communication, right, for, um, used for food and reproduction by the first bacteria on Earth. Um, also, similarly, we will learn from our other guests um, that by studying natural soundscapes, actually, we learn that other than human species not only listen to, but communicate with each other. So in this conversation today with David and Cecil, so we are going to learn a way to access and communicate with the world by activating forms of sensorial intelligence, of emotional intelligence, which remind us that there is more to reality than meets the eye. Um, and in that sense, what well, humans have predominantly used, you know, our visual, you know, technologies to access and understand the world, um, in fact, there are, uh, a variety of other bandwidths of systems of communication, layered system of communication through which we can access and understand what surrounds us. So without further ado, I'll just introduce them both just to have a sense of things. There's not going to be any visual aid for this, uh, for this talk. Um, so Cicel uh, is a chemist, a linguist and an artist who has now for over three decades really dedicated herself to uh, pioneering a research-based practice that is focused on the science of smell uh, and exp the exploration of olfactory ecosystems as conduits to build a more profound and engaged um, understanding of the world. She runs a, a lab, her, her smell research lab in Berlin, which contains now over 10,000 right, um, smell molecules and smell recordings, which she uses in a variety of ways that we are going to learn of more um, in a little bit. And David Monaki instead is a eco-acoustic composer, a researcher and an artist, and the driving force behind a project and um, an eponymous non-profit organization that is called the Fragments of Extinction that he started in 1998. Um, so uh, David's um, project is really devoted to studying and preserving the sonic heritage of the world's oldest and most diverse uh, primary equatorial rainforests. Um, and this venture really builds on various insights from science and that you'll tell us more of uh, in, in, uh, in a, really shortly. Um, and it's really a work that is built to raise awareness around the massive deterioration of the earth uh, biodiversity and also like the acceleration of the global extinction rates. So, um, Cicel, uh, we all want to learn what is contained in these tokens oh, that you ooh. have given us, you know, like today, uh, how you manage, you know, to do that. Um, but I really just, you know, to prompt the conversation, I, I, I want to quote you yourself as once. This, uh, I think, is beautiful. You describe your work as looking into how the world comes across on behalf of its invisibility. Please. Yes, uh, I try to understand the air we all breathe. The only thing we share in this world is this air. This air contains particles, molecules that tell us a lot about who we are, where we are, and what's going on. We tend to overlook uh, most of the things and, and immerse into the world using the different senses, make yours understand it much more holistically, engage with the topic of concern emotionally, and never forget that experience. So what I do is record air molecules, volatile emitting from smell sources. With advanced technology, I'm able to, like you do a smartphone shot of an image, I do the same with a device that break down a smell source into multiple molecule structures. 
So what you had on these cards today are literally chemical compounds used in nature and among nature and animals to communicate certain things. One is attraction. The first one is a molecule produced by bacteria inside Earth to tell other insects, come to me, and the insect smell this as meat, if I might use a metaphor from our type of rhetoric. The second is a molecule produced by a tree to tell the insect, don't come close, I'm hurt. I have a wound on my bark. The third molecule is pollution, it's ozone. This I brought into the agenda because it breaks, it shows how pollution breaks the chemical communication between plants and insects. So if we don't start to kind of understand kind of sensorial ecology in a different way, we can also not be able to protect it. So looking into invisibility, learning from other animals, scaling down for the purpose to scale up, I think is what I tried to do in my work for 25 years. Recording with invisible reality, breaking it up, we restructure it, placing it into a comfort zone and get people's attention and uh, trigger emotion because I don't think without emotional Reaction, there is no action in this world. We can talk about all this issue of climate change and deforestation and inequality, racism, but it's just words, you know. We need to engage with this issue with our body. And what smell accomplished is to add back joy and playfulness right. to the understanding. And I think that is essential to action. So, so all I do is being a child again. <laughs> because that's how we start <laughs> Lucky off, you, you know? yeah. lucky you, good for yeah. you. But I, I really want you to, to uh, uh, you, you already, you just mentioned, you know, words. You have, you have, you know, used this, uh, this expression. So I, tell us a little bit more of how your background as a, as a linguist actually comes involved in, in your practice. Because I know you have built uh, you, yes. lexicons of smells and etc. So what I, when I started off, I got very confused because I had no t terms and no kind of in semantics, semantic, there were no words that describe anything that I experienced. So lack to, to language, I started to research how come is it possible that we cannot talk about smell. And the knowledge is solid enough to be able to do that. The fact that I said uh, before was uh, we can decontextualize smell, take it out of the comfort zone, and focus on how to talk about it. So I build up a language uh, or a semantic, semiotic kind of expression uh, archive, having people smell the same smell all over the world and record their phonetic expression towards it. Because smell is so quick, bypassing rationality in the brain, activating emotions. So, there is no rational language towards smell. It's only emotional mm. language, so to say. So literally smell is feeding the emotional intelligence in the brain. So if you provide the brain with a molecule, it immediately gets emotional reaction. And that comes out in paralinguistic sounds, like <gasps> yeah? And if you start to record those sounds, suddenly you have a system. So mm -hmm. I've been doing this you now for a couple of years. Now I'm building up a database, uh, developing AI to make sense out of it. And hopefully one day we will have a library like this for how to talk to other senses than reading and looking at things. Right. Yeah? So this is like, but I, let's go back a second because I think that, you know, of course, between your, yeah. yours and David's work, there are a lot of like common points for sure and aspects also of how you both had to, as pioneers of what you have, you're doing in your fields. Uh, uh, and that's why I mentioned collecting and archiving, you know, like as important aspects of, you know, of what you do uh, and forms of engagement. Um, so you had to build your own technologies. So you, you know, um, how, how is that working in your case? Because of course, um, David has, you know, his story to tell and, but these are all forms of sort of um, yes. attempt at building engagement, right? So not everyone yes. is a scientist. So how do you do that? So in my case, I, the knowledge was there, but it was used for other purposes than my intention was. So the knowledge was primarily used to cover up the reality. With the, with the, you know, there's an industry that literally do products, call it perfume, that they're the run detergent, which purposes is to cover up reality. So I approached them asking, can I get access to your knowledge for the opposite purpose? Can I use your knowledge to reveal the reality we live in? And maybe then you come and do your job. 
And the uh, company thought that was so outrageous, they didn't dare to say no. So I became the devil's advocate in the biggest corporation in the world that do all these molecules for all these products that, uh, you know, abstract slurries and bad looking bottles that not always do good to the world, but of course, they are also necessary. And we all know with COVID, you know, we are sanitized more than ever. And uh, yeah. now we need to kind of get back to reality. How do we do that? You know, so finally the world also see what I do as kind of important you know, right. to reveal and then maybe leave it or then also cover up if necessary. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And it's also like definitely, I mean, there's also a common, you know, purpose of, of course, in sort of yeah. creating awareness about something that also doesn't really find its own way, let's say, through mainstream media, you know, from, you know, also channels of communication. You're both engaged, in fact, in a lot of artistic, creative work. Yes. Um, a lot of knowledge is out there. Just, to, you know, how do you apply it differently and well, how do yeah, you get sure. access to it? You know, it's a little bit what we both do, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so and in fact, so you also both work a lot in different kind of institutions. But uh, David, so among the many things that you do, teaching, you know, research, and etc., you are also a co-founder of the Institute, um, the International Society of Ecoacoustics. Um, perhaps we can also start from there, talking about ecoacoustics, and definitely what is it that we just uh, we just heard. Right. Um, thank you for having me here. Before <laughs> that. And thank you to Simone and Andrea for this invitation. Um, yes, um, uh, after a few decades of uh, bioacoustic studies, which were mostly species oriented, uh, science started to realize that it was time to apply all the knowledge that we have on single species, on single relations and interaction between few species to entire ecosystems. This was the idea of the International Society of Ecoacoustics, which started in uh, uh, 2016, 2014 actually, with the first conference at the Museum of Natural History in Paris. And we started this society with, with the idea of opening up really the knowledge to the complexity, mm -hmm. to the integrated complexity of an ecosystem. This is difficult with sound. Because uh, once, you, once you're uh, opening up again your microphones to something so complex as the sound excerpts that we've heard about mm -hmm. just at the beginning, uh, you are exposed to so many biases that uh, you, need, uh, you really need the big data approach in order to sort out profiles, proxies, indicators mm -hmm. of what's going on in ecosystems through sound. This is the main scope of ecoacoustics. But with fragments of extinction, um, I'm not a, bi a biologist. Mm -hmm. I'm a composer, I'm a musician, I'm a professor of, ele of electroacoustics. <laughs> so what I'm doing there, it's, uh, it was needed to have the ears of an artist, mm -hmm. of a sound engineer, in order to collect mm. the fragments in a different way, in a complex way. Very good point. Right. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I ended up being part of the board of this uh, international society. We are now at the fourth conference, uh, international conference. There are really um, hundreds of scientists from all over the world. But my point here is while we're, we're collecting the big data that we need in order to say something with numbers uh, of what's going on in there, in, ecos in complex ecosystems, in order to, to do some provisions mm -hmm. of what, we, what ecosystem will be more exposed to climate change, for example. While we're doing this, we also need to marry another approach, which is getting the samples in a three-dimensional way in order to have something that will be in hands of our nephews and our nephews can, can, will, will listen how the world was before the expected high acceleration of climate change on, ecosystem, on ecosystems. Sorry. So um, 
uh, I started in 2002 in the Amazon, and then many other uh, expeditions in Borneo, in Africa, and then Amazon again, and then Borneo, and then. So in order to collect as soon as possible samples that were uh, done with an increasing technologies, mm -hmm. uh, nowadays we, uh, our protocol is to use three systems uh, with the, one of these systems is 32 microphones recording at the same time with, with high definition recordings as well. Why doing all this technology in our own forest? Mm -hmm. Because the Challenging spatial... Challenging itself, by the way. Challenging, uh, you know, it, it's also a technological utopia, but uh, it turned to be very important after 20 years because yeah. we have samples of something which is changing, radically changing already. So, um, but the most important thing, it was to, to try to collect the spatial cues of an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. It is so important when, when you are in a rainforest, you immediately understand that visuals are not important there. You don't see things. You are blocked by the undergrowth. Mm. So right. the, 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 the organs, the sense of perception of space is definitely sound and smell, of course. Yep. But for, for humans, for natives I work with, is definitely sound. You know, you have uh, immediately the, the perception of something happening 200 meters away, mm. something happening two kilometers away, and something in the proximity. Mm. So all this, uh, uh, the mapping of all yeah. these territories, sonic territories, the species use in order to, to define their home, to mm. find their partner, all these spatial cues are very important in the protocol and in the, in the, in the process that we are trying to put into the forest and yeah. to reproduce for, for the public. Yeah, because it's, I, I think that, uh, of course, here, you know, we are talking a form of like this chemical, you know, sort of factor, olfactory, you know, intelligence. You're speaking of acoustic, you know, uh, sound intelligence, you know, so it's about activating, triggering also way of literally sort of learning our ways around things um, differently. But um, I, I heard you speak about this in, in other interviews I, I mentioned uh, to you earlier. And um, Going back to what we heard, so the samples that you know we right. just heard, so you explained that uh, there are there is something as acoustic niches, so um, and that in fact through your sampling and through the work that you're doing, you have really found out there is a form of interspecies communication there, where, where species make space for each other when they communicate. Can you tell us a little bit more of this? Of course, it's it's uh, now well known. Um, it's not uh, fully demonstrated. It's an idea of one of my colleagues, Bernie Krause, as well, which is working with this. We, are, um, we have been working on some projects together. And, but uh, it's, uh, it's very simple. You know, acoustic uh, resources have to be divided in order to communicate in the same environment. We're talking about the most diverse ecosystems on Earth. Mm -hmm. so, how is that possible that species do not divide their sounds in order to communicate together with conspecific individuals uh, in, in other parts of the forest? So, in other terms, uh, niches, as we have uh, resources, niches for food, for everything in nature, we have acoustic niches, of course, which are frequential, which are temporal and typological, different kind of niches. And uh, as soon as you go, in a primary forest, which is, uh, 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 which is uh, pristine and which is uh, as much as possible undisturbed, oh, right. you find that, that niches are incredibly clear. Mm -hmm. So there is an intelligence there. There is an acoustic intelligence that from a composer point of view, it is so important to collect, to save fragments of, for, for studying also in the future, which was the acoustic imprint of evolution, of many millions of years of evolution. Uh, so every animal, every insect uh, that you've heard in the, in the beginning, in this complex, complicate, have you, have you heard how complex was the soundscape? How many layers were there? All those layers are sorted out by animals. Every conspecific animal knows which sounds to listen. Right. And which sounds uh, pertain to species that are dangerous. Exactly. Or, so it's a very incredible, intricate yeah. system of sound that is beautiful. 
it's yeah, all so beautiful. And so yeah. it's, it can tell us something about our relation to nature. Why don't we play that in theaters? Yeah, we play Beethoven Fifth Symphony. Okay. Why don't we, now at the starting of climate change, why don't we stay for 10 minutes in a theater listening to the composition of uh, evolution? So this, this was my provocation, right. let's say, in my world of contemporary music and research music. But also, uh, uh, it, it is important to understand that uh, what you have uh, reproduced uh, in stereophony today mm -hmm. is uh, <clears throat> just a, a small part of what uh, we usually collect, which is a spherical sound, which is then reproduced for people in a spherical array of loudspeakers, right. uh, uh, which are your, your sonosphere, right? The so, sonosphere and the ecoacoustic yeah. theater. Yeah, right. so it's, I, I think also it's, it's, it would be interesting also to hear also from, from you, Cicely, in the sense that you both have to, uh, you know, of course you practice as scientists, you practice, you know, as creators, uh, but and, as artists. So let's say the cultural, the cultural, you know, field becomes your primary conduit to, uh, you know, divulge and to communicate, you know, what you try to do. Maybe you can um, speak a bit, you know, uh, also, Cicely, about your, well, variety of projects, but you do a lot also within the realm of education, um, and you have, uh, uh, you're a founding member of, of this Future of Education collaboration with Nanyang University, right, in Singapore. Yeah. Maybe you can tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, again, if you go into, look into curriculum, most schools, you'll learn uh, about how to see and how to maybe sometime hear, but definitely the rest of the senses are completely let out, you know, so, in kindergarten, we are all uh, allowed to use all the senses to understand the world. We learn in a context of play and joy, and we never forget what we learn. And this process happened from zero till puberty, and even before zero. You smile before you see your mother. So what could happen, also now with COVID, you know, all the kids sitting on screens, you know, what if there were some exercises do, dealing with listening to sound, or smelling each other, or finding out what's going on in the world, in the immediate world? you know, beyond the screen, you know, I think we will have a lot of less issues, you know, with uh, anxiety of various kinds if this was the case, you know, but yeah, so I've been doing a lot of workshops. I try to kind of, in, in Finland, it's very advanced in education, mm. and we're trying to, to write new curriculums and try to embed it in various steps of um, education. So I do that always in the context of, of showing my work, you know, I work across commercial, uh, creative, and also education in general. I also work with big clients, like I work a lot with Balenciaga, uh, for uh, the same reasons and same pur purposes, you know, like uh, with, with doing a project on climate change. You know? So what's going on in the air we all breathe, that is starting point, you know, what can we, how can we make sense of that kind of information for multiple purposes, you know? So, uh, yes. And, and you, David, so you teach in Pesaro, right? You have, uh, yeah. which where you also have this, the, the sonosphere, right? The theater, like the, the acoustic theater that you were mentioning. So what is, you know, your engagement and with your students? What is it that you practice? Well, uh, my, my students are, are, do, are... Is this project, I mean, coming involved, uh, you right, know, right. more specifically? My students are university students and uh, some of them become part of this project. Uh, follow me in the, in the mm. recording expedition and, and so on. But the important thing we learned from the Sonosfera in Pesaro was that, is that, um, is really senses can be immediate yeah. to everybody of us. Yeah. Exactly. Even exactly. children. Yes. I mean, we have uh, children coming three times to listen to pure ecosystems into the Sonosfera. Even because, okay, we, <laughs> we managed to, um, to do complete darkness in the sonosphere. So there's yeah. no eye, there's no visual cues at all. Yeah. So eye closed and eyes, eyes open and eye closed is exactly the same um, result in the sonosphere. So we have uh, almost 10 minutes of complete darkness and it's an occasion to trust your ear in order to build the space around you, as uh, blind people do all the time. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, so becoming um, very popular <laughs> there, 
the listening sessions in the Sonosphere, but uh, I'm convinced that we can use senses in, uh, in a creative way in order to shorten the, the, the path we have uh, in perceiving the urgency now within the ecological transition. So we don't have time. We need to use yes. all the matter we have, yes. all, this, all, the, all the mediums we have in order to, to shorten. Amitav Ghosh was saying yesterday that uh, it's, uh, we are not reacting as fast as we need to do in order to meet the ecological transition. So let's use so how do we do it? whatever. You should well. team up. <laughs> Definitely. No, but I think in terms of education, you know, there's a whole, in my case, the whole world to smell, and in your case, the mm. whole world to listen Definitely. to, and the whole world to educate how to do it, right? You know, and how do you do that? And you have to be, just scale down again, learn from animals, learn from your surrounding, you know, and then you scale up again with a different experience. And learning in the context of using your emotion, yeah. you never forget what you learn. It's like we learn everything we are applying now, we learn from zero to puberty, end of the story. And then the rational part of the brain take over and we become pragmatic, competitive, and unhappy, you know? So how do we do that? How do we design for the senses, all of the senses, in a playful way, you know, playful, intelligent way? I think it's the key to tolerance and to changes, you know? Otherwise, forget it, you know? Blah, 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 yeah. you know? Does not work anymore, you know? Like Greta Thunberg so intelligently say, blah, 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 yeah? <laughs> no. Well, Stop talking, close your eyes, become a little insect, smell your armpit and have an exciting moment and have a conversation beyond what you ever <laughs> suspected to ever have had. You know, we're sitting around the dinner table looking at food, smell the food, you know, smell each other. I mean, you're never going to forget that experience. Well, we can conclude on the smell each other. I think this is a fantastic Especially today you know, take here. Away, smell you know, climate the change, session. 40 degrees in, in this amazing library of smelling books. I mean, it couldn't be a... This is heaven here for us Absolutely. Today. Embrace <laughs> the provocation, the outrage, you know, ooh, as, ooh. Cecil, as Cecil said. Thank you so much. We are over time already. This was incredible. Thank you again for sharing with thank us. You. Thank you. Actually, it's an it's a event to have you all here. <laughs> wow. Do I smell good? I'm not very sure about it. Well, thank you so much for uh, this fantastic start of the, second, the third session. And, uh, and of course, for giving us the opportunity to smell and to think and to listen very differently today. Our next speaker is Valerie Trouet. Actually, sorry, I didn't present myself. I'm Andrea Trimarchi, and I'm the co-founder of Forma Fantasma, and also the... <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> and curator of this uh, first edition of Prada Frame. Uh, our next speaker is Valérie Trouet. Valérie is a professor in the laboratory of Three Ring Research at the University of Arizona. She's a dendrochronologist whose research focuses on climate and how it has influenced human systems and ecosystems. She has published over 19 scientific papers and is the author of the recently published Tree Story in Italia, Gnanelli della Vita. Valérie will introduce dendrochronology. Based on examples, she will explain how three rings can teach us about human, climate, and forest history, and how the three are linked to each other. Valérie, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea and Simone. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a, it's a great honor. Um, this space is phenomenal. Uh, I'm a dendrochronologist, which means that I use the rings and trees to study history. History of humans, history of climate, and history of forests, obviously. I consider trees to be witnesses, witnesses of what happens around them. So trees witness what happens around them, and then they record it in their rings. And as a dendrochronologist, it's my job to read what they record in their rings and then to translate it so that we can understand what the trees are saying, the stories they're telling. That part of the job, the translation part of the job, is, is fairly easy to do because most people 
are familiar, at least with the concept of tree rings. The concept of tree rings. Trees form a ring each and every year, and that means that if you count those rings, you can get an idea of how old the tree is. I think most people here have maybe as a kid looked at um, stumps of trees and counted their rings. <clears throat> if you zoom in on those tree rings, this now is a microscopic image of the tree rings that you saw before. You can actually see the individual wood cells. On the left is the pith of the tree, so the inner part of the tree, the bark is on the right. And what you see here is a number of, of tree rings zoomed in. And so what you see is the early wood that's light colored, and then the late wood that's darker colored. So as the name says, the early wood is formed in spring. Late wood is formed in the fall, in the summer and the fall. And then after the late wood, um, when it gets darker and colder, the tree stops growing altogether in winter. The next spring, the tree starts growing again, but it forms early wood again, which looks very different from the late wood of the previous year. So the growth ring boundaries, the tree rings that you see, is a transition between the late wood of one year and the early wood of the next year. This here is a photograph of a conifer. And the concept of early wood and late wood is very similar in uh, deciduous trees. So this is an, uh, these are growth rings in an oak. Uh, deciduous trees of gorgeous, gorgeous wood anatomy. Um, this is just one example, and, and the next speaker, Gerhard Koch, will talk a lot more about, about wood anatomy and, and the function of it. I mentioned that trees are witnesses. Um, and lucky for us, they can be very long-lived, and so they can record our history for a very long period of time. This here is a bristlecone pine. These are the oldest uh, living trees on Earth. They live on, in the western US on the boundary between Nevada and California. These trees can be a lot 4,000 to 5,000 years old. So this tree, Methuselah, started growing when we were still building pyramids and it's still alive now. This is a living tree, still adding additional tree rings every year. Luckily for us, to core such ancient trees, we don't need to cut them down. What we use as dendrochronologists is a hollow core. This is our instrument in the field. Core it by hand into the tree. Uh, it's about uh, uh, half a centimeter in diameter. Core it into the tree, however deep you need to go. And you can extract this sample out of the tree without damaging the tree and especially without killing it. So the sample is about the size of a pencil. We then take those samples back to the lab. The first job, so this is a series of these samples, the first job is then to sand the samples very nicely so that the rings come out. And what you notice, um, if you look at one of these samples, is that the rings are very clear but they're not all the same size. So trees from narrow rings in, in bad years, wide rings in good years. And so trees form a sequence of narrow and wide rings. It's kind of like a Morse code or a barcode. Narrow, narrow, wide, wide, narrow, 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 wide, wide, and so forth. <clears throat> then comes the most important part of dendrochronology, which makes it a science rather than just counting the rings. And that is to compare the patterns that you see between, from different trees to compare them to each other so that we can actually date them. And the advantage of those patterns is that they preserve in the wood. So we, if a tree dies or is being cut down, those patterns don't disappear. They are preserved in the wood of the trees. And so one of my favorite examples to, to demonstrate this idea of cross-dating of comparing the patterns of trees is this, this photograph. These are now three, not cores, but three pieces of wood, of oak wood, um, and they're, they're pieces of three beams from three medieval houses from uh, England. So these are three buildings built at different times and different locations, um, but you can see, if you look here at the top, you can see this pattern of three 
I've got to <laughs> look at it from a little bit more of a distance, of three wide rings here, the middle one, that comes up in all three of these, of these uh, beams. And the reason for that is that these, the trees from which these beams were cut all grew at the same time at the same place. And so they experienced the same climate and experienced the same sequence of good and bad years, even though the buildings themselves were built in different locations and at different times. So this allows us to date. So we're not limited to living trees. We can date wood and material using uh, dendrochronology. Uh, that can be historical buildings, in this case, also art history. This is the Miraflores triptych, um, supposedly by the Flemish primitive Rogier van der Weyde, 15th century, uh, painted on oak panels. One of the panels hangs in Granada in Spain, the other two in the uh, Metropolitan Museum in New York. I mentioned supposedly uh, painted by Van der Weyde in the 15th, uh, sorry, 16th century. No, 15th century. Sorry, I should know my dates as a dendrochronologist. When dendrochronologists dated the panels, the oak panels that the painting was painted on, though, they found out that the most recent ring in the panel was 1492, which is 30 years, after, almost 30 years after Van der Weyde died in 1464 meaning that the tree from which this panel was cut was still alive and kicking and growing tree rings in 1492, long after Van der Weyde died. So there's no way that Van der Weyde could have painted this because the tree was still alive. <clears throat> so in addition to human history, trees also record environmental history, for instance, volcanic eruptions. What you see here is similar to the first slide I showed, so high uh, microsco microscopic image of a conifer, in this case, a pine tree from Mongolia. The ring that you see here is the year 536. And what you're looking at is a frost ring. It's a ring that is an anomaly in the wood that is caused by frost that happens during the growing season. So when it freezes during the growing season, the water inside uh, the wood freezes and the, and the wood implodes and creates this kind of frost ring. I mentioned that this is from a tree in Mongolia. Same year you can find frost rings in the bristlecone pines that I was talking about and in various other old trees across the world, indicating that we're dealing with a volcanic eruption in 536. There's also Roman um, writers that write about the fact that the climate cooled down. So when a, a volcano erupts, a big explosive volcanic eruption, it can cool down uh, the climate worldwide. And that is recorded in the rings as these, uh, in the trees as these frost rings. <clears throat> trees can also be used to study climate history. Uh, these are some of my favorite trees uh, to do so. This is a blue oak tree that is about, grows to be about 500 years old, and they grow in the Central Valley in California. They're my favorite because they're super sensitive to drought. There's not a dry year in California that goes by that is not recorded in these trees as a very, very narrow ring. <clears throat> and in, from 2012 to 2016, California went through a, a very severe drought. They're going to another drought now, but 2012 to 12, 2016 was very severe. And that was expressed, amongst others, uh, in the snowpack of the Sierra Nevada mountains on the east side of California. So here you see two satellite images um, of the snowpack uh, of the Sierra Nevada. So you see the state of California, Pacific Ocean, to the left, the, the white area is a snowpack in the Sierra Nevada to the east. Um, on the left, the left image is taken in 2010, a very average year. Uh, this is what the snowpack in a normal year looks like at the end of the wet season, the end of April, sorry, the end of May, March. The photograph on the right, exact same photograph, but taken five years later, 2015, exact same time of the year. And you can see just how much that snowpack has shrunk 
because so little snow fell in that year of 2015. In fact, 2015 was the lowest snowpack over the 80 years that they have been measuring snow in the Sierra Nevada. So they would not measure as little snow as in 2015. Now my team set to work because we thought we can do better than 80 years. Um, and we used those trimmings from the Blue Oaks to put the 2015 snowpack not just in an 80 year content, context, but in a 500 year context. So this is the only graph I'm gonna show, I promise. Um, what you're seeing on the horizontal axis is time with the present on the right and then 500 years going back. And the vertical axis shows how much snow there is from every year, the past 500 years in the Sierra Nevada. The dotted horizontal line that you see is how the snowpack in 2015, so very low. And when you compare the black line to the dotted red line, you see that actually over the past 500 years, there has never been as little snow in the Sierra Nevada as in 2050. So this is how we use tree rings to put current climate change in a long-term perspective. Now with drought in California uh, comes another phenomenon, which is wildfires. And I'm talking about California now, but you know, this is where in Italy, a uh, very similar Mediterranean climate. But so with drought come, comes wildfires. Uh, and those uh, wildfires we can also study using tree rings. So when you have ground fires, fires that burn, as the name says, close to the ground, they might burn off, they burn off the grasses and the underbrush and the undergrowth, but they typically don't kill the big trees. They might damage the trees, the mature trees, and leave fire scars like this. Now if you want to sample a fire scar tree like this, unfortunately you cannot do it with a core. You have to go in with a chainsaw as they've done here to go in with a plunge cut and take out a wedge, basically, of the tree. When you then look at that cross section of the tree, this is now a wedge taken from a tree in, in Northern California, but you find these throughout the American West. The tree, the sample was taken in 1998, and you can see 14 fire scars. So each of these scars is a fire, a ground fire that went through the forest and it damaged the tree, but the tree survived these fires because they're ground fires. Through dendrochronology, we can then date each of these fires, so we can put a year on when each of these fires happened. And what this, uh, this is just one sample, but what it shows is not just a system, a fire system of very frequent ground fires. Every 10 to 15 years, a fire would come through this forest. But what's remarkable is also the lack of fires after 1889. So you have very frequent fires between 1765 and 1889, and then crickets, nothing, until 1998. And this you see throughout the American West. It's very difficult to find any fire scars in the 20th century. What happened is that the Forest Service was established in the American, uh, in, in the USA, um, in the beginning of the 20th century with the mission to protect forests. And the, their idea of protecting forests was putting out wildfires, so fire, fighting the f wildfires. And they were very good at it, to the extent that almost no fires were recorded in the 20th century. And to show you the effect of uh, that fire suppression, that century of fire suppression that's been going on, um, I, I use some examples from this repeat photography project. So this is a photograph taken in a forest in the, in the Sierra Nevada in 1923. Okay, sorry, in 1923. Um, you can see a, a forest in two, with two distinct layers. So the very big mature trees, and then a, a distinct, much lower layer of shrubs and grasses. And to show you the difference between these layers, Here's someone standing right here. So this is a park-like forest that has very big mature trees. And this kind of park-like forest 
<clears throat> is typically the result of the ground fires that I was talking about. So the ground fires run through the forest every five to ten years. They burn off, they clean out the forest, burn off the grasses and the underbrush every, every ten years, leave the mature trees alone, and then the grasses get five to ten years to, to grow again, and then they get, get burned off again. Now, if you go repeat photography, means you go back to the same spot, in this case, 75 years later. So the photo on the right is taken in the same place, but in 1998. And immediately, you can see a very big difference in the structure of the forest. So the, those two distinct layers are gone. 75 years of fire suppression of no fire means that all the grasses and all those little trees have had 75 years to grow. And now they're no longer little trees, now they're mid-sized trees. And so this has two effects. One, there's a lot of fuel in this landscape. If a, if a fire, when a fire happens now in this kind of forest, you don't get an innocent ground fire. You get a fire that, that blows up the kind of fires that we're experiencing now in, in the western US. So one, because there's so much fuel on the landscape. Two, because literally those mid-sized trees create a ladder, a ladder through which the, the ground fires can climb up through the mid-sized trees and reach the crowns of the mature trees. And so you get big destructive fires, like the kind that we're seeing now. Big destructive fires that are much more dangerous, uh, or much harder to fight. And let's not forget that these Fires are not happening in a vacuum, right? They're happening while our climate is changing, while it's getting hotter and it's getting drier. So we're not just dealing with an awful lot of fuel, but that fuel is also extremely dry. So it's, it's, it's really increasing the fire risk um, and it's waiting for a disaster to happen. So with that, um, I hope I have explained in a, in a short session um, what all we can learn from tree wings, what they can, the stories they can tell us about human history and climate history and forest history and, and how the three of them are linked and also how that helps us to move forward into the future. I'd like to thank you for your attention and thank Andrea and Simone again. For your Thank you, Valerie, for this fantastic introduction to wood anatomy. Uh, and I will keep um, a conversation going regarding wood anatomy, welcoming on stage Gerald Koch, which, um, with whom we have been working uh, at uh, a previous work. Gerald is a wood anatomist, curator of the Scientific Wood Collection at the Tuning Institute of Wood Research, Hamburg, and fellow of the International Academy of Wood Science. Gerald also teaches in the fields of anatomical wood identification and utilization of international traded timbers. Please, Gerald, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. You want to sit on that chair? Yes, please. Directly, or I can do it. No, here. you can. No, please okay, sit thank there. You. So we, I can see you better. That's right. Thank you for being with us, Gerald. It's nice to to see you here. Um, you know, with you, with whom, with you, are, we are going to talk about um, wood anatomy, but uh, connected to a different ways of applying this. And uh, you work at the Tuning Institute. I would like, please, to have the first slide. I would like you to introduce uh, what the Tuning Institute yes. is and what you do there in this fantastic uh, wood library that you have there. Yeah, at first, many thanks uh, to give this talk for this very important impact on applied wood research and especially to introduce our institute. Uh, the Tunin Institute is a federal research institute in Hamburg, Germany. Uh, we are also part directly of the German government of food and agriculture. Our basic work is to analysis wood formation, properties and utilization of international traded timber, especially to advise our policy but also education of students and also to promote this very nice material you see here. And in this background, I'm also the curator of one of the largest wood collections of the world. In our collection, we have uh, about 40,000 specimens from about 12,000 individual species. And what you can see here is only our second, our doublet collection, 
which represents the international traded timber. Based on the stuff of about 12,000 species, in all species, uh, we have six to 800 which are regularly make it. Only six to 800 are on the regular market. That means there was a high potential of so-called lesser known species which are wait for the market. But we have also the problem that this timber is strongly endangered if you discuss about CITES and other very strong controls. And this is our part, especially for our government, to educate and to promote these references. Great. Thank you for this uh, brief introduction. It's very useful. I think, uh, Gerard, what I think it's very important to discuss with you is how the wood identification is actually applied to fight illegal logging. Uh, because, uh, of course, said like this, it doesn't seem that the two things can be correlated. So can you tell exactly what you do there, maybe even the technical steps mm -hmm. that you go through for wood identification to fight illegal logging? Mm -hmm. And maybe I can play a little clip of a film uh, that we actually have been uh, shot at the Tuning Institute when we came visiting yes, you. Right. So the, the image is not blurred, this is actually what you see mm -hmm. on a microscope. And here we have uh, uh, images both of uh, paper fibers and wood specimens. Mm -hmm. That is crazy. You started with the strongest demand we have, because we have also seen the nice images by Valerie, where you normally have the three anatomical directions. If you have a wood block, we can prepare with a microtome, very thin sections in the three anatomical directions, about 10, 15 micrometers of transverse, radial, and tangential orientation. And in these wood blocks, we can, yes, define up to 80 characters in the three anatomical direction, like a very nice anatomical fingerprint. And these methods are very established, like this nice library. Wood anatomy is, I think, a very established method than more than 150 years. And all big collections have these uh, microscopic slides uh, where we can use, or mentioned, about 80 characters. What we see in here is our new demand, because we also have to identify fiberboard material. Because if you come from industry, what is mainly traded on wood material Solid wood is nicely and very fine, but all furniture consists of particle board, of fiber boards, plywood. And uh, if you later discuss about regulations, the current regulation require also the identification of individual fiber elements, which are produced all over the world. And the big problem we currently have, if you see in this image is here, we have only remaining characters because the wooden material is dissolved. We have not any more the three anatomical direction. We have inval fibers, or especially for the hardwood, only the vesselment. Only a vessel element, which you can see here, with a very nicely pit structures like a fingerprint, can help or must help us to identify the timber. And this is a very hard job if you see this mixture of fiber, bronchymal cells. And here you now see. That is one bottle here, or one vessel element. And now we use reduced characters, also with new image system. But we must do it, because they strongly underlie regulations. I think we are currently the only institute worldwide who offers this expertise to identify fiber-based material. And in fact, uh, Gerard, let's do a little step back. Um, can you tell us when this idea of fighting illegal logging through the system was introduced, also on a policy level? in the uh, European Union, because it's not since a long time right. that this is happening. I think mm -hmm. this is relevant to share also with right. the public, which are not really fully familiar also with the term illegal logging. How is that actually defined by European Union? Yes, it's very important because we know the problem that illegal logging is one of the main reasons of worldwide deforestation and contributes what we have seen to climate change. And we started at first, it was a very good promotion by NGOs to establish certification system based on sustainability. So that you know ne, that we need the certification, FSC, Forest European Council, or PFSC, Pan-European certification system. But the problem, these are not a character as a law. It can be used for controls very nicely for trading, but the problem increased with illegal logging. And so the European Commission starts in 2010 to implement the first laws, European Timber Regulation, which was implemented in Germany in 2013 and also together with the other European countries. It's only nine years ago that we had the first laws to control illegal logging. And now we have to develop the methods to control it. Uh, especially, we have some international 
laws like the United States AC Act or the CITES protection, but in Europe only about eight, nine years we have these laws to control the systems. I mean, when we talk about illegal logging, we discussed this previously, but I think it is also important to address how, I mean, this is not really part of, of your practice, mm. but how European Union structure this idea of uh, illegality of wood. Mm -hmm. Because of course, if I am an exporter of wood from a country that does not have a regulation, mm -hmm. what is the European Union doing? Is it imposing a set of rules that have been already set here in Europe, or are there other ways mm -hmm. to you know, ask for, for yes. regulations? It's right. At first, all company who import material to the European Union or worldwide have to build up a so-called due diligence systems. You must prepare all information which are required especially to identify the species and where it comes from. That is very important, the due diligence system. And then, based on this experience, they have the laws to combat illegal logging. But it's not so easy, especially for one example, and also to explain where are the problems also in wood anatomy. We have also seen this very nice images of oak. Uh, with wood anatomy, it's very easy to identify the oaks uh, on a macroscopic level and the microscopic level. But where the oaks comes from cannot be clearly identified uh, with this uh, tool. And that's very important because oak, which is very favorite timber all over the world, have a natural distribution, the white oaks uh, in North America, in Central Europe, and also in Asia, also some protected Siberian, especially, or Mongolian oaks on this. We have no chance to do it. And therefore, it's very important to adapt, to combine new methods with genetics, with isotopes we work, that we can also consider and fulfill this very important part of wood origin. But it's a, a strong job worldwide. I discussed it before for one example, especially. Because if you go in big families of the tropical timber, maybe red maranti for the frames and others, with one family or genus which clearly defined assortment of the timber, we have about six, 400 individual species. That means you must collect from all parts of the world individual species to build up references on genetic level and also especially for isotopes. But we are under pressure because the current law says we must do it. The due diligence system must adapt the system. And it's a very strong job. Genetics works very deeply that we can define especially species and origin, but references. One example, we have currently the problem with the beer and large, which is a extremely combated to trade depending on this very terrible war we have. So the beer and large, very important timber on the European market, have a transect about 7,000 kilometers. That means for genetic analysis, you must collect about 550, 100 kilometers individual samples to build up the references. And that is a, a very hard story because some laws say we must do it, but we have no chance in the short time to adapt Indeed. all the systems. Indeed. There is something else that I thought was really interesting when we came over to the Tuning Institute, is that I was expecting to find uh, objects containing illegal timber, maybe at least they would be exquisite, you know, using like uh, incredible specimens of timber. But in fact, the objects were extremely mundane, things you can find in a hardware store, or even uh, charcoal for barbecue. Can you tell us more about this experience you have and where you actually found mm. uh, illegal timbers? Right. Yes, I think it's uh, easy to consider that the most problem illegal logging depends on high value timber, especially the strongly protected rosewood, the genus Dalbergia, also included now African rosewood, uh, Guiburtia genus, uh, which consider or uh, encompasses about three, four, five species, and uh, the true mahogany and ebony. I think that is the strongest focus where we found illegal log timber because you can earn much, much money on this. One example, most of the, one example of the most valued timber, the black ebony's from Madagascar Island. You can pay up to 20,000 euro if it arrived on the Chinese market where there's a very high request for this material. That means the risk to use it on an illegal log logging is, is very, very high, 20,000 euro per cubic meter. And the problem currently for the Ebenis we have is that if it comes from central continent of Africa, it's not protected, only the region of Madagascar, Iceland. I think we have a strong job, especially to adapt the system. Or also, we found regular ramen. Ramen is be used for frames, especially Italy have a very strong market on this. Ramen grows the swamp forest of the 
area of Borneo, especially, or Kalimantan, Indonesia, and Malaysia, where the orangutan monkey live. We destroy the origin, the nature of the monkeys by using this forest swamp ramen forester. That is was example we regularly find on this. But I can tell many, many stories uh, of the true mahogany, especially, mm -hmm. but also in products like plywoods, which are produced in Asia. We have a mixture up to 10, 15 different species, which are declared as a one material. And all, if we found declaration or wrong declaration, indicates something is wrong. But to evidence, clearly, this problem is very hard, because you must all layers identify and try to identify the origin of this material. Gerard, I have one last question. That's to do with um, the ownership of these libraries, because mm -hmm. You know, this is a, you know the, the scientific pro process works in a way that you have a sample of material, and of course you need the comparative library to understand uh, what kind of wood is in front of you. And um, the countries in this moment has have this knowledge are mm -hmm. countries that have a, a colonial past because they have been collecting wood, wooden specimen from all over the world, and hence the Netherlands, England, right. Germany, and so on. What kind of efforts is it mm -hmm. in place in this moment yes. to make sort of this knowledge available for so yes. others that do not have That's possibility? That's a very, very important question because we must transfer our knowledge. That's very important. But uh, based on new techniques, I think there was a very good progress. At first, we are a governmental institute. That means we provide all, in our, all our information. And you can try it directly in a few seconds or minutes because during a few weeks we have uh, created a new database. It's a free app where you can use, it's called Makro, Holz, the German term for wood data, one term. And you get it free on a smartphone or your iPhone and what you prefer also for Android. It includes a description of the most important 150 species traded worldwide with a computerized identification key. It's also available in English and Espanol. That means we provide this information for custom service, for control, for sites, but also for practical applications that you can control. That means if a governmental institute, we put it free. We develop currently also on new methods like machine learning, especially examples which you have seen for fiber analysis. You need so deep experience with reduced number of characters that you need a new, uh, we call it artificial intelligence. We build up a machine learning system so that the images can be done by all libraries all over the world or labs there. And then the computer, we know it from practical application, will build up the system. I think that will be the future, but we are under the pressure because to say the future, the European Commission works on a new law. The European timber regulation will be substituted in 2023, a short time, in this new deforestation free product system. And I think it's have higher requirements and it means the scientists under pressure to adapt all the systems. Gerald, thank you very much for this introduction to your yes. work and to how wood anatomy yes. can be applied. Thank you. You see how wood anatomy can be very applied. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gerald. I, I'm also cleaning up the stage. Uh, and I would like to call now on stage Alice Rostern, who will moderate the next conversation with Alexander Daisy Ginsburg. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. I'm Alice. This is Daisy. Um, and we're going to hear all about her latest project, Pollinator Pathway. I'm just being the waitress. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, while Daisy's being waitress, I will introduce her. And it seems very apt to end the second day of the Prada Frame Symposium by talking to her, the designer, artist, researcher, and technologist whose work is steeped in the key themes of Prada Frames, design, technology, nature, loss, and reinvention. Now, Daisy describes her work as examining our fraught relationships with nature and technology, and she has devoted over a decade to doing so, 
so by experimenting with synthetic biology, artificial intelligence, biodiversity, and evolution. She's won many prizes and participated in many exhibitions, and her work is part of major museum collections all over the world. Now, each of her experiments, like her writing and research, interrogates the underlying ethics of major ecological challenges, specifically by questioning whether we, as humans, have the right to redesign our lives regardless of the needs and wishes of the other species with whom we share our planet, or in one case of her projects, other planets. Now, Daisy's past projects have also been conceptual or speculative experiments, but she's now immersed in her most ambitious endeavors so far, an ineluctably practical project named Pollinator Pathmaker. So, Daisy, how did it come about? Well, <laughs> um, I think what we're going to be seeing behind is um, composites from Pollinator Pathmaker, and hopefully we're going to be immersed in this, this garden while we speak. So Pollinator Pathmaker was a true pandemic project. I was asked by the Eden Project in Cornwall, which is an ecological attraction, an educational charity that's very different to a botanic garden. It doesn't have a colonial style collection. It's more of a place um, where audiences can interact with nature and learn about it and, and feel agency about protecting it. And they were making, um, a competition for a new artwork about pollinators to bring attention to the jeopardy they're facing. So I didn't know this, but 70% of, of insects, for example, in Germany have disappeared over the last 30 years. And pollinators are not just honeybees, they're bumblebees, moths, ants, wasps, and, and in some ecosystems, bats, mammals. It's um, kind of an extraordinary panoply of the natural world. And many plants have evolved to need an intermediary, intermediary to have sex, basically. So grasses can be wind pollinated, but all these flowers require um, insects. So Eden was commissioning a new artwork to bring attention to the jeopardy of pollinators. And having made a lot of works over the last few years that bring attention to the biodiversity and climate crisis, it seemed to me to be a bit nuts to make a big monument out of steel and other materials and instead to make something for pollinators. And so I called it a living artwork and then had to figure out how I was gonna do that. <laughs> so how did you figure that out? What yeah. were your original objectives in yeah. terms of realizing the project? So the starting point was really um, a photograph by a scientist uh, from Exeter University called Jolyon Troshianko. And he is a sensory ecologist and looks at um, how insects see. So when we look at the world, we think we're seeing this room, but of course our eyes have evolved to sense and see in certain ways. And bees, for example, see, uh, they don't see red, they see green, blue, and ultraviolet, whereas butterflies see red, green, blue, and ultraviolet. So when you think about a garden, and when we create gardens, we think about how it looks from our perspective. But the real users of the gardens are the plants and the insects and the other species inhabiting that space. So I thought, well, if pollinators design gardens, what would humans see? To try and sort of switch this question around. So if you start to think about plants, um, I mean, basic things, like it never occurred to me why flowers bloom at different times of the year. And that is because their pollinators have evolved, uh, co-evolved with them to emerge at the same time. So it's like super simple when you think about it. But if you're designing a garden that suits all the different pollinator species, you need to think about um, sort of successional blooming across the year. I also then wanted to think about what, um, how they perceive depth and space and forage in different ways. So I'm sorry, this is super, super nerdy, but I get so excited about it. There's um, a scientist called Lars Chitka who puts radars on the backs of bumblebees and other species to track how they forage. And a bumblebee may visit 10,000 flowers in a day, and they can memorize that. And it's an amazing mathematical problem called the traveling salesman problem. So I wanted to think also about how insects forage. So rather than arranging a garden and tasteful beds, it's about how do you create a garden that maximizes empathy for other species? And in the process, tries to not let my taste get involved and cater for the tastes of other species. So that was 
the brief I set myself. And then it turned out to be really difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so how have you yeah. realised yeah. that brief? What technology yeah. have you yeah. used? And to what degree have you been taking yeah. decisions? And to what degree have you delegated them? So I decided, I've worked a lot with technology in the past as a way to understand the decisions that humans make about the world. So I spent, as you said, 10 years working with synthetic biologists who are engineering nature, redesigning life itself for human benefit. And I really wanted to think about um, how I could create something that uses, that kind of highlights this and uses the technology in another way to, in a way, buffer from me. So I proposed that I'd make an algorithm and this algorithm would take away the decision making. And what's very fun working with um, uh, scientists and engineers is working with an amazing string theory physicist called Shemek Vitacic. And I said to Shemek, we need to make an algorithm that can maximize empathy. And, and what you're seeing here is some of the algorithmic garden designs. And he sort of was like, OK, Daisy, but um, what is empathy? <laughs> so I said, well, OK, I need to find a way to translate that into code. Like, how can we take this kind of emotion, which is about trying to create another set of perspectives to use design not in an, uh, hum for human benefit? Is it possible to think about technology and design in a way that um, is altruistic? Or is that just a, an impossibility? So I defined empathy as maximizing diversity, the, the maximum number of species solved. So the algorithm is choosing plants from a database. Um, it's a long list of plants that we curated with experts at Eden and pollinator experts. That turns out to be really difficult if you're not a gardener. So I've been learning to garden through all of this, which is the wrong way around to do things. Um, and the algorithm then arranges the plants. And so what you're seeing here is the outcome of the algorithm. And I, I painted each of the plants in, in the database to create these visualizations to help you see the garden across time and space as well. So all these ways that we're thinking about the natural world and this static environment or as from a human perspective, you know, what does it feel like to fly through a field of flowers when you don't perceive depth in the same way as a human? Um, and then you can, on the, so this, the, the next part of it is pollinator.art, which is the website which you can play with right now, if you, <laughs> rather than looking at this. And you can create your own garden using the algorithm. And what's really important there is that you can do this, which is to switch the colorways as, as a way to, again, try to see the world from this other perspective and to play like um. an insect. And for the, the original iteration yeah. of the Pollinator Pathway at the Eden Project, mm. obviously to some degree it's um, an activist tool for campaigning um, ecologically, but it's also a tourist attraction. Yeah. So to what degree did you, I mean, plants flourish and then they die. Mm. To what degree did you try to ensure that there would always be something to tantalize the visitor, knowing that that would also articulate your environmental concerns and your underlying message? Well, I really wanted to think about how humans are not the audience for this artwork. So, I mean, for the, the tasteful gardeners in the audience, I hope that um, if you stand in front of a pollinator path maker garden, you'll feel slightly sick at the kind of tasteless array of colours and mad heights. At Eden, we have, I think, 65 echiums, which are these towering skyscrapers that are originally from the Canary Islands, and they are the echium pinanana, and they grow up to three or four metres tall. So hopefully, when a human visitor sees this, this 7,000 plant garden, they'll think, oh my God, <laughs> who was let loose? And that's really the intention for the human visitors just to have a shock. But the human is not the audience. The audience are the pollinators who are flying in from other places, stealing bits of the artwork, taking um, it away to other flowers, bringing bit back um, pollen and helping it flourish. So it's a really strange way for an audience to appreciate an artwork. I mean, it's a garden, but by calling it an artwork, suddenly you're changing your perspective. You are th having to think about who's actually um, enjoying this. What does it mean to look at an artwork? What does it mean to be transformed, to be changed, to look at something from a different perspective? 
Um, um, what does it look like from the perspective of a bumblebee who's you know, deep inside a foxglove having the most delicious aesthetic experience? And um, so playing devil's advocate, I have to ask that obviously you've emphasised that empathy is absolutely key to this, particularly in terms of human beings, accepting that this is a, an artwork for pollinators, not for, for them. Um, but how empathic are the pollinators likely to be to one another? Because did you select or identify the species you wanted to be attracted to specific plants so that they would be an empathic and mutually supportive rather than mutually destructive ecology? Well, what I, I know um, is that I have no control. <laughs> So having worked, and that's what's so interesting for me in comparison with the work that I've done before, working with synthetic biologists who are engineers and all about control. And I've discovered that gardeners are much more terrifying because they are able to not have control because you can't control the, the living world. It's and that's, the joy that's and the, curse. the That's the interesting thing about synthetic biology is that this idea that we can have absolute control. Is, is just a human way of thinking and, and putting a model on the world. So for the bees and the butterflies and the wasps and the moths and the ants and all the creatures who are using this artwork, um, I don't know. We just planted the first one in September. It's just coming into bloom and opened at Eden. And we've planted the second in London for the, the serpentine. And the next one will be in Berlin. And what we want to do is to start to study the um, not just which pollinators are visiting and what's thriving, but to think about a, a research methodology that can allow us to compare things that aren't easily comparable. There's 150 plants in the database. Each time you create a garden, you get a different selection, and it's a randomly generated artwork, essentially, that's, that's solved to optimize for pollinators, but they're all different. But if you think of a garden, a garden is not a thing in isolation. A tree is not just a tree, it's all the interactions it has with the environment and, and the sort of Western scientific model creates the single image of, of the plant or the species and actually it, this is a living mass of stuff with things flying in and the stuff going on in the soil. So a garden itself is interacting in a landscape and with all the things that are flying in and out and so we want to think about working with um, the plan is to work with the scientists at Exeter, Christopher Kaiser Bunbury, to think about how we can look at the pollinator mapping across landscape scale. So this gets really interesting for me with the, the, the DIY part of the project, um, which is for people to plant their own editions of the artwork, because then we can start to look at how a big artwork for a museum is actually interacting with smaller artworks around them. and nothing belongs, you know, to, all we can do is try and control it and, and, then, and keep it alive and you have all these interactions flying in um, and cause it just doing its own thing and potentially dying, living, having wild sex with the, some of the plants and the others being squashed. It's, I don't know. It's Trampling, <laughs> the sexier ones. So um, can you talk in practical terms? I mean, the Serpentine Gallery, which commissioned mm. the second um, Pathmaker, has, is 250 miles from the Eden Project mm. in, in Cornwall, but in a completely different setting of Kensington yeah. Gardens, which is actually a much more perilous site than mm. one might think. It sounds incredibly grand and looks it, but actually it was a munitions dump during it's the Napoleonic yeah. Wars. And of course, the history of the, the underbelly of, of the earth affects whatever any gardener mm. attempts to do on the surface for centuries um, after it happened. So how in practical yeah. terms did the algorithm for the Serpentine mm. Garden differ from the Eden Project well, It's one? the same algorithm, that's what's... That's no, the no how, how is the, its the conclusion outcome. different? Sorry. Well, the, the real conclusion is the other species. So we have a little problem with squirrels <laughs> in Hyde Park, Kensington Gardens, that are eating species that they shouldn't, or not meant to like. Um, so chives, alliums, so that's the first sort of meta problem. But we chose, so the scheme for Eden um, is on this very steep slope in this old um, pit mine. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a clay pit. Originally. Um, and 
you know, sort of 35 degree slope, which is a very interesting thing to plant. Um, and Kensington Gardens is flat, it's amongst trees, it's shaded and protected, but again it's very different because it's full of people who can walk through it and dogs and, and squirrels and, and other creatures. Um, the scheme for Eden, I chose something, so the algorithm can generate an endless number of gardens, which you know, for the typical garden designer who spends a long time you know, drawing up this perfect scheme, we're just like pressing, you know, create, 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 which you can do the same on the website. And then the problem is you have hundreds of things to choose from. And there's an aesthetic. You can't help but start to make aesthetic choices and get in the way of the process. So for Eden, we chose something very stripy. Um, so it's these big drifts and it's like a billboard. So bees and insects coming in can see this big stripy 55 meter billboard. And serpentine is more meadow-like um, random drifts and it's in 11 flower beds over 250 meters. So each one is almost like a unique garden because some species can only fly 200 meters, you know, beetles randomly crashing into things, whereas bumblebees are flying in four kilometers. So I have no idea what the outcome will be. And, and this is slow art, so it's three to five years. The garden in, in Kensington Gardens will be there for two years. Eden is five years. Berlin, I think, will be five years. So this is, it, it's going to change. And so writing even the maintenance manual for these things is really complicated. So. And so, I mean, you were extremely successful as a conceptual and speculative um, designer, and that's enabled yeah. you to be entrusted with a hugely ambitious um, project like this. But what are the lessons you've learned about the, the difference of realizing a practical project yeah. and yeah. the theoretical work you were doing before? I think they're all real because they all end up being in galleries and museums and, and in a way <laughs> the difference here is that this stuff lives and dies and you can't control it in the same way. Um, but I think the, what, what, like what's really important is the difference between the conceptual and the real impetus here for me is about, about agency. And pollinator pathmaker is not a solution to the pollinator crisis, it's not intended as a design solution. Um, it's not, it's not going to make the world a better place. <laughs> um, which well, is, it could if you're a beetle or a bumblebee and yeah, nearby. Yeah, marginally better, I guess. Um, but the, the idea is, for this mo what I'm seeking is this moment of transformation. So I'm, I, as I said, I'm not a gardener and I've been learning through this process, which is crazy privilege. Um, but the idea of having for the beginner gardener, this moment of transformation where you, you, know, you create a scheme, unlike an NFT, you're not just like, oh, I'm gonna you know, buy this thing and have this secret thing that lives on the internet. Instead, it's like I can download the planting instructions for free um, and plant this thing, and that's the investment. It's an investment in time, energy, and finding space, potentially having to fight for a space, you know, raise money to do it. Um, and then the moment where you plant this thing, and I, and I went through this, I, I've not designed a garden before, planted one, and I had to plant this thing and was like looking at the plan and my, my partner was sort of running around very disgruntedly sort of passing me the plants and we plant by numbers. Um, and I'm like, this is real gardening. But the moment then when I kind of stood back and had to plant this thing, I was transformed into a steward or a caretaker. This was out of my control. I was, I was like, how does this all make sense? And there's this moment of, what well, it's an ongoing moment of me over the last seven or eight months trying to keep my own one at home alive, learning by looking, learning by you know, having to go through this process, and I'm transformed in that process. And that's, for me, is, about, is a moment of empowerment and a, and a sense of agency that is a very small way to quell my own panic at my inability to do anything uh, useful about the climate emergency and the biodiversity emergency. And I hope that, for me, that's what's different. That's the experiment. So the gallery is a really important place. The museum's a really important place for me. It's a, a place, the same as this library, a place dedicated for reflection. But there's something about, you know, having your hands in the mud, looking at a bumblebee, trying to figure out if you recognize it, I, they all look they're all like in stripy jumpers and you can't tell them apart. And then you're sitting there with the book and trying to work out which one it is and how do you record it. And it's those moments that actually, um, to try and slow down and to, to look.
um, and to take care. And that's, that's, for me, what's different with this experiment. And you've talked about the sort of populist mm. part of the project, enabling mm. other people to um, create their own pollinator pathways and then cultivate mm. them. Has that actually started yet or has it just gone live? Well, this is what's nuts because the whole thing was meant to be a sculpture. And then I said, because it was the pandemic and lockdown, and I was like, what? I said, you know, I started to think about distributed fabrication of artworks. So I had work locked in museums. This was April 2020. And the thought that a whole artwork could actually be sent in a packet of seeds seemed really powerful to me, that we don't need to be shipping these big things around and, and that there's this um, different way of thinking about it. So the website that we built with support from um, Google Arts and Culture and the Gaia Art Foundation was just this mad experiment, basically. It was like, well, we'll do it. But we had no funding to launch the campaign. And so that's, for, for Pollinator Pathmaker, it's sort of a, boot, it's a bootstrap project, essentially. We started with the first Garden Eden. We created the first plant list, we created the algorithm, built this website, put the algorithm online for anyone to use with a European sort of um, it's a British climate, European, um, not like this, uh, plant list. And then the next step is to encourage commissioners in other countries to join in. And that's what's happened with Light Art Space in Berlin. And we're working with them and the Natural History Museum in Berlin, creating a new plant list so that then when they plant their big garden in Berlin, they can start their own DIY campaign to encourage local users to create their own. So that's the idea is that we're sort of figuring it out as we go along, how to, on a very small budget, try and create the world's largest climate positive artwork, which is a mad goal. <laughs> <laughs> and um, obviously museums and galleries mm. are great partners mm. in that respect because they have huge engagement um, networks within their local communities mm. and, and beyond, and they're accustomed to um, conveying these kind of projects to their audiences. But how do you see this project mm. evolving from here? I mean, it's already been extremely successful. I mean, one has opened in Cornwall, the Serpentine project opens later this month, mm. and the Berlin project is underway. Do you see it continuing to expand at this scale, or does it need to develop mm. in different ways? Well, when you plant one, then I know. <laughs> Um, but that's what's really, really key to it, is the, what's, what we're, there's, I talked about empathy at the scale of, of trying to create, or think about design um, and why humans create things in a way that is not for our benefit, and actually in this case using design and technology as a barrier for us to us and for my, my own prejudices, and of course that's an impossible task, but it's the provocation. Um, there's also this empathy sort of, and generosity built into the model as a whole. So I mentioned sort of asking these international commissioners to come on board, and in that process where we build networks, so this is the model that we're testing. Um, is, so the Natural History Museum in Berlin convened a local expert panel to work on the, the new plant list with the support from Eden. Um, what we're doing there is then there's a philanthropic act in that. We're going through a research process. I have to sit down and paint more flowers. <laughs> and then it's donated back to the website. So at the core of this is also trying to challenge um, some of the models in the art world. So the more the greater the value, rather than the fewer, the greater the value. The more additions, the more successful is the work. Um, the more DIY gardens in an unlimited edition, the more successful, because they all interact with each other. Um, and then asking these institutions to engage on these research projects, building these networks of collaboration for institutions who, for their own funders, need to justify that they are the first or the only commissioner. It, we're ask, we're, we're, it's challenging, because it disrupts a lot of these models that are the back end of, of the art and design world. Um, and that's, it's a real battle if you're, you're trying to do something experimental and we're having to build this whole new model the whole way through. We're giving stuff away for free. We have to be able to fund um, the work. 
the, the DIY portion is super important to me and figuring out how to do that as someone who has no experience at doing this kind of work is, is terrifying and really exciting. But yesterday we got some pictures from someone and I think we're going to put it on Instagram today, someone who's planted one and actually sent us pictures um, in a community garden and that was just the best moment. It was like they used the algorithm, it worked, they planted it in the autumn and there is a DIY garden that we have pictures of and, and I think there are more um, but we're just getting going and it's sort of figuring out how to do it backwards um, having you know no experience um, how to do it well but also the the sort of time issue of literally mm -hmm. waiting for the garden to grow which is frustrating at the moment <laughs> of course in a year's time will seem yeah. like a gift yeah. because it will go on and on yeah. and on and they'll it's evolve a, and evolve it's a really different pace it's really interesting and um, and, and you know, again, the gardeners here would, you know, and that's part of the joy is that they're sort of going to be you know, shaking their heads, being like, how do you? <laughs> of course. But to plant an artwork that's really, it's going to take two years. So it'll be um, three years from the first idea for the artwork to look anything like it might. And then it will take another year for it to really look good is um, really slow. And it challenges a lot of, the, you know, it's like we're not making anything new. It's, you know, we're just waiting for this echium <laughs> to well, do something. Well, I have every confidence yeah. it will be worth the, the wait. Mm. Daisy, thank you so much for talking to us uh, about Pollinator yeah. Pathmaker. I'm very much looking forward to well, seeing I it hope, in Kensington I really, Gardens. I really, I need you to plant my house because then <laughs> I will know I have got through to the beginners. <laughs> Daisy knows I'm a plant-killing crap gardener, so <laughs> this is her evil plot. Um, Daisy, thank you so thank much. You. And Andrea and Simone, um, we're in awe of you for yeah. organising this amazing um, symposium. You have another thrilling day to come tomorrow, but thank you yeah. so much for inviting us. And thank you to all of you for coming and listening.